So Paul, we have this kind of uh, driving coronal mass ejections leaving the surface of the sun, and some are powerful enough to be blown all the way, uh, well, across the solar system by a wind, uh, I assume called the solar wind. Uh, and sometimes yeah. they can plow into other things. That's right. So we get a wind from the sun all the time. Um, so in some sense, if you ask where the edge of the sun is, the answer would be well beyond the Earth's orbit. We're kind of in the tenuous outer regions of the sun. So the solar wind is in some sense. But then you occasionally get the much more violent coronal mass ejections, which throw much more stuff out. Yep. Now, this was first spotted by my favorite thing is comets. If you look at the tail of a comet, so there's well, two here, right? Yeah, so you can see there's a sort of white tail called the dust tail. A comet's basically a dirty snowball. Okay. So it's a mixture of all sorts of ices and gunk of various organic crap and dust and other things like this. And as it melts, the dust blows away and reflects the sunlight, which gives you one tail. Yep. But also there's a second tail of ions, and the ions are not affected by the radiation from the sun so much, but they are affected by the magnetic field in the solar wind. Ah, because they're ionized. It's ionized, yes. So the solar wind is very low density, so for a dust grain it can ignore it. It's not ionized, so it'll just fly away in its orbit as pushed by the radiation from the sun. Yep. But the ionized particles are affected and they pushed away. So the fact that these two tails, which has been known for hundreds of years, was the first real evidence that there was a solar wind. So one is always proportionate to the direction of the solar wind, and the other... The other one is, a, uh, is due to the solar radiation pressure in a complicated way. Now what happens when this reaches the Earth? Well, the Earth has its own magnetic field, That's generated right. by its own dynamo deep in some sort of currents in the Earth's surface. But we only have one North Pole and one South Pole. So even that reverses from time to time. Um, but the magnetic field... Um, stops the solar wind from hitting the Earth, okay. but again, being a plasma, it tends to move along the magnetic field lines, which means it tends to come down towards the north and south magnetic poles. So it follows those lines into the poles. And this produces aurora. So um, here's, first of all, is this a picture of the Earth's magnetic field as viewed from space. So the Earth's magnetic field still extends out for actually quite a long distance. That's right, and it's pushed away by the wind from the sun, so it points further down solar wind than up solar wind. Okay. But then the radiation as it comes from the sun, the solar wind, especially when there's a coronal mass ejection, but even all the time, yep. it then moves down these field lines towards the poles. And you can see, as in here, a space view of aurora. And so this is why we get the aurora at the north and south pole most dominantly, because that's where the magnetic field lines are coming in and out. That's right. So what's happening is the solar wind or the coronal mass ejection is sliding, as we've said, it spirals around the magnetic field lines, so it moves down towards the north and south pole and typically produces a ring around each pole. And then as a radiator, the fast moving particles plow into the upper atmosphere, they excite emission lines. So if you're seeing the green color in the aurora is an oxygen emission line and the red color is a hydrogen emission line. So the bigger the radius or the bigger the extent of the aurora is, related to the, the power of the energy of this coronal mass ejection as it hits the Earth's magnetic field? That's right, because there's a usual complicated interplay of the magnetic fields, the whole magnetic hydrodynamics. So here's a view from the International Space Station, quite beautiful. So you can clearly see it in the layer of our atmosphere. Yes, so it's not occurring in space, it's occurring in the very tenuous, far too thin to breathe, upper layers of the Earth's atmosphere. And we're again talking about the solar wind following the field lines down and plowing into the extreme upper part of the atmosphere. And so it's exciting the gas in our atmosphere. That's right. If you look at it from the ground surface, it's a lovely sight. Now, are, are the waves related to the way the, the, these, these waves of ions are traveling into the magnetic field? So what you're looking at here is probably a whole bunch of magnetic field lines. The field lines extend up into space. Yep. And what's happened is the solar wind has ejected particles into it and they followed down the field line. So these rippling curtains are just sets of field lines with fast particles moving down them. Yep. And so let's luxuriate in a few pictures of the aurora, the northern or southern lights. Now, Have you ever seen it? I've never seen it, but I guess this is going to be my question, right? When people do these aurora chasings, they actually have to time it to the seasons of the sun, so to speak, with the solar activity is, right? Yes, so there won't be very many at the moment because it's a solar minimum, but when there's a solar maximum, you get more radiation coming out from the sun. And especially if you have a coronal mass ejection heading our way, you can get a spectacular show and it can even move further away. Mm. So I've seen the corona from Canberra, it wasn't very spectacular. No. The best I've ever seen was looking out the window of a plane flying over Antarctica on my way from, to observe at a telescope in Chile. That's the benefit I know a lot of people if they're going from you know, the northern hemisphere, the southern hemisphere, cutting over Flights those poles. go very far north and south and you see these things. Yes. So quite spectacular. But these 
um, solar storms that hit the Earth can have negative effects. Yeah, because I mean, obviously, this is actual energy and electrical energy, as we know, now being transferred to our Earth's atmosphere. Yes. So here's again a simulation of the uh, magnetic field of the Earth, and we're going to uh, hit it with a solar flare, a coronal mass ejection. And what it's going to do is it's going to bend the magnetic field lines of the Earth. And that means the magnetic field at the Earth's surface is going to change. If you had a sensitive compass, you'd see the needle vibrating backwards and forwards. And this, when you get wires going extending over large distances, like, for example, the power grid of yep. a country, these changing magnetic fields will generate electric currents, and these unexpected electric currents that can sometimes burn out transformers. Because right. you, have a lot of, uh, you have a lot of energy now for, um, that is now alternating current, now direct current being pumped into your electrical grid. Yes, and so in the, I think it was 1989, a, a major coronal mass ejection knocked out the power grid of part of Quebec in yep. Canada. Um, back in the 19th century, there was a much bigger coronal mass ejection called the Carrington event. Now, back then, they didn't have big power grids. But they had telegraph lines. And the telegraph lines were actually, people could send telegraphs with no electricity connected because the sun was providing enough electricity to send signals. And sometimes you get sparks. And some of the operators were electrocuted. Exactly, that's right. And I think they even reported that they saw some aurora towards almost the equator. That's right. So they're seen through, through in Queensland and Australia, and they were seen in Texas and the United States. So um, if another one of those happened now, there's a lot of worry about how much damage it could do. Luckily, we'd probably see it coming and can warn the electrical utilities to switch off or disconnect things in advance. Because unlike eight minutes for the light to arrive, it does take about three days for these coronal mass ejections. Hit and we have telescopes looking at the sun the whole time. So we say, oh, oh that looks like a very big coronal mass ejection heading our way. Better start shutting down some of the power grids when it hits. But what happens to the stuff in space on the outside of this magnetic field or the weaker magnetic field? So if you're out in deep space, the amount of radiation can be very serious. If a coronal mass ejection had hit the Apollo astronauts on their way to the moon, they would have all died from radiation sickness. Mm. In low Earth orbit, like the International Space Station, you're actually inside the Earth's magnetic field. It protects you. Because these obviously extend for a larger distance of that. But you would expect a little bit more radiation and potential interference, but not enough to be instantaneously. It could lethal. even be a problem for high flying aircraft. I know Concorde had radiation detectors on board, so if there was a major flare, they could dive to thicker layers of the atmosphere to protect themselves from it. So, this is the sort of thing that you actually have to do think about. Is, but as you said, we do get a lot of warning now that we have lots of satellites continuously monitoring. And it's us. certainly a danger for satellites, especially the ones that are further out, like in geostationary orbit, that aren't protected very well. Mm.